Okay, so there's certain guidelines that we want to follow when we're drawing the Lewis structure of something. So for example, um, uh, with a, let's just do another example here, PCL3. I want to draw this, what's the very first thing I should do? What's that? Okay, P goes in the middle, surrounded by three chlorines. That's fine to start. Now what? Okay, so let's calculate the number of electrons. What do I put for P? How many electrons? Five valence. Chlorine? Okay, seven times three is 21. 21 plus 5, 26. Now, if you're getting odd number of electrons, that should be a clue to you that something's wrong. You shouldn't be, okay? So, because electrons pair, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to pair electrons. We're bonding them so that they can fulfill their, uh, their pairs, okay? So, if we have a structure, a Lewis structure, it should have um, paired electrons. So, you shouldn't have odd numbers of electrons. You should have even number of electrons. Okay, so now what do I do? I, I know how many electrons should be in my structure. Okay, draw dots. <laughs> draw dots. Okay, so I need to put. How, how do I know how many electron, how many dots or electrons do I put on these elements? They all have to have eight. Good. They have to have eight. How many am I going to put on that central phosphorus? Two more because it already has six, right? So each chlorine here needs six electrons or three pairs, three lone pairs. Needs three lone pairs here. Okay. Um, the central phosphorus needs one lone pair. Okay. Now what? Okay, how many electrons are on that structure? Twenty six. So is this my structure? Yes. 26 electrons is what I need. I have 26 electrons. Everything's following the rule of eight. So this is my structure. Okay? So uh, earlier, right here, remember, if you start out with um, just two things bonded to your central element, that will be your initial structure will have 20 electrons. If it's three things bonded to your central element, your initial structure will have 26 electrons. If it's four things bonded to your central element, your initial structure will have 32. So if you ever start out with 20, 16, I'm sorry, 20, 26, or 32, then you know the structure you start out with will be your structure because you won't have to manip manipulate it at all. It will be your first uh, structure. Good. Okay, so those are the steps I need to follow. What if it was 24 here instead of 26? What if the number of electrons here was 24? What would I have to do? I'd have to make a double bond. Somewhere between one of the phosphoruses and the chlorines, I'd have to make a double bond to satisfy um, that 24 electron requirement. Okay, Because every time I make a bond, I remove electrons from both of the things I bonded to, and that reduces the total number of electrons by two. Okay? Okay, so um, when, we, when we're looking at bond pairs, one, a single bond is one pair of electrons, just two electrons. A double bond is four electrons, so here's a double bond right here. And a triple bond would be six electrons. That's what they would represent, okay? So if it was H, I'm sorry, H, bonded to H, O, double bonded to O, finish off those, 
and n triple bonded to n. These would represent here, I would count four electrons in that double bond. Here, I would count six electrons in the triple bond, and then here's the last two electrons to make eight on that nitrogen and eight on this nitrogen. So they're following the rule of eight still. Okay, so we've already kind of looked at polyatomics. We did one structure last time, okay? Uh, so with polyatomic ions, we have to consider the charge on the ion. It must be accounted for when we're uh, counting the number of valence electrons, okay? So here uh, is an example where we have NH4. So the nitrogen has five. We have four hydrogens. That's four. Four plus five is nine. But this has a positive charge on it. What does that mean? Do I add or lose electrons? I lose electrons. So I need to subtract one electron, okay, and I get eight electrons in my structure here. All right? So uh, that's how I'm going to get this structure. And remember, hydrogen can never make anything but a single bond. And it can only ever be on the outside. So it can only make a single bond and can only ever be on the outside. So this will be four hydrogens surrounding the central nitrogen uh, with a positive charge. And we have NH4 plus. Okay. Uh, here's carbonate. We drew carbonate last time, but let's look at it again. Okay. So CO, CO3 to minus. Carbon has four, O3, uh, oxygen has six valence electrons, oh, I'm working it. 18. 18 plus four is 22, plus two more, that's 24 electrons, okay? So we have 24 electrons uh, in this structure <coughs> based on the number of valence electrons, or 24 valence electrons. Okay, so when I start my structure out, C, O, 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 put eight electrons on everything. Without even drawing this, finishing what I'm doing, how many electrons are going to be on that, L, on that carbonate to start? 26. Can you already see what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to make a double bond somewhere, right? to make it 24. So before I even draw it, I already know, I already have an idea, oh wait. I'm gonna start out with 26 because it's three things, right? And I, it has 24 in it, so I have to make a, a double bond on this. And that's what we'll do. We'll make a double bond to remove a pair of electrons from here and here. And the only way I can remove electrons is by making that bond and so that I can maintain the rule of eight, okay? So now, this carbon has two, four, six, eight electrons on it, and the oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons on it, and everything else also has eight electrons. Okay, good question. And we're gonna talk about that. It's called resonance, okay? And um, as far as drawing the structure, no, it doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay. Um, so here they're just going through. They're going to show us. Uh, we're going to draw that structure. We're going to get the, the Lewis structure with a double bond on it. Okay. Um, so bond energies. One thing we should understand about double bonds and triple bonds and single bonds is that a triple bond is stronger than a double bond. And a double bond is stronger than a single bond, okay? So the triple bond is the strongest. And as you go down, it gets weaker to single bonds, okay? Now that also has something to do with the fact that the bond length changes as I move from a single bond to a double bond to a triple bond. So a single bond is longer than a double bond. So as I make that double bond, I pull the nuclei closer. And as I make a triple bond, I pull them even closer together, okay? 
So you could imagine that if I was going to break a bond, just think of like, I don't know, a stick or something. The longer the stick, the easier it is to break, right? So those single bonds are easier to break. They're longer, they're farther apart. But as I move in closer, okay, uh, and I create that double bond, it, it becomes harder to break. And then I get a triple bond and it's even closer, it's even harder to break, okay? Requires more energy, more energy to break that triple bond. Okay, now this is, uh, to answer your question, resonance. So here you can see, we have the double bond right there. And here we have it right there. And here we have it right there. So if I was actually going to draw this, and I guess the best way to draw it, um, I would draw all three of these structures. So which one's the most correct? They're all correct. Okay. So if I was going to actually draw carbonate, I would want I would actually want to draw all three structures to represent it uh, in its actual form. Okay, with that double bond resonating throughout the entire molecule. Now, which of these actually exists? None of them. Which one's correct? All of them together. Okay, makes no sense, right? Okay, that's because we can't actually draw the actual structure of this. Because if you consider, um, so in the literature, when you, when you look at it, which oxygen has the double bond? Well, when they, they measure the distance between the oxygens and the carbon for any of those oxygens, they all have it. But it's a hybrid bond. It's not a true double bond. It's kind of between a, a double and a single bond. And it just, it's, it's a, that double bond character is being distributed through the entire molecule and creating a hybrid bond that we can't even actually draw. Okay, so how do we represent it? We represent it as, as all three structures. So, and this isn't actually even the best way. So, um, because this is a polyatomic ion, we'd want to also put the charge on there. Okay, so this is more how we would want to represent that double bond resonating uh, throughout this carbonate molecule. Okay. Okay, so let's practice. Okay, let's practice drawing these 12 molecules based on um, the rules that we've laid out. Okay, so there is a concept that we call expanded octets, okay? So you know how I've been drilling into your head? Rule of eight, rule of eight, rule of eight, right? Um, so now I'm gonna tell you there are some exceptions to the rule of eight. So I already, tell you, I already told you that there were a few that come before carbon, remember? Can boron have eight electrons around it? No. How many can it have around it? It has three valence, right? It can only ever make three bonds. 
How many electrons is that? Six. It can never have eight. Beryllium could only ever make two bonds. How many electrons is that? Four. Four. Okay. Um, hydrogen can only ever make one bond. That's it. Okay. So I could never put more than one bond around hydrogen or two bonds around beryllium or three bonds around boron. So those are exceptions to the rule of eight in that you have a deficiency. Now let's talk about when you have an abundance of electrons around an element. How is that possible? Look at number five. Okay, Phosphorus, surrounded by five fluorines. If I bond five fluorines to phosphorus, how many electrons is that on phosphorus? Ten electrons. Wait a second, that's not following the rule of eight. Okay, so if ever you encounter something that is not following the rule of eight, okay, it is possible that that's okay. How do I know if it's okay? Well, here in the second energy level, I have an S and a P sub-energy level in the second energy level, right? How many total electrons can I put into the second energy level? Six. S is 2, P is 6, that's 8. 8 electrons. The third energy level has how many sub-energy levels? So the second has 2, the third has 3. S, P, and D. What is um, this energy level right here? 3D. 3D, right? So the third energy level has S, P, and D. How many electrons is that? 18 electrons. Okay? 18 electrons. So, what that means is that if I am oxygen in the second energy level, I can only follow the rule of eight, and that, that's it. That's all I can do. Okay? But if I am sulfur, or phosphorus, or chlorine in the third energy level, or anything past the second energy level, I also have a D sub-energy level, and when I get to this point, have I filled the D sub-energy level? No. My 3D is right there, right? It's empty. Have I filled the D sub-energy level for bromine? No. It's right here. The 4D is right here. I've, it's empty. So what I can do is that, let's say I have something like sulfur, okay? It has how many valence electrons? Six. It has an empty D. So normally, we would look at sulfur and we'd say, sulfur can only make two bonds. Sulfur bonded to, let's say, oxygen, oxygen. Okay. If we actually did this, we would need to put a bond there. Okay? We'd have SO2. Okay? So, this, I would say, okay, sulfur can only make. Um, that was a bad example. Let me do it like this. Okay, those two bonds. Because if I look at its uh, electron orbital diagram, okay, if I get to the S, so this is the 3S and the 3P, I only have two empty electrons. So I could, should theoretically only make, be able to make to bonds, which is what it does a lot of times. But the thing about sulfur is it has an entire empty energy level. So if it wants to, it can push 
all of its electrons into being single electrons. So it has the 3D. So it can move its paired electrons up into the 3D. Now how many things could it bond? Six. It can make six bonds. This is called an expanded octet. Now look at phosphorus. How many valence electrons? Five. How many things, if it expanded out its octet, how many bonds could it make? Sulfur has six valence electrons, it can make six bonds. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, it could make five bonds. PF5. Okay? So that's why we have a PF5, because it expanded its octet. And it's okay, it can do that. All right? So phosphorus, uh, PF5, would look more like this. It's all, all five of its valence electrons get expanded. This is the 3D. Expand them out because it's an, just an empty orbital. It has it so it can fill it out that way. Okay? Uh, chlorine can also expand its octet. Um, usually it doesn't do it to where it makes seven bonds. Usually what it does is it makes a few, usually it can only make one bond. So usually when it's, it expands its octet it can make uh, a few bonds um, with certain things and then put those extra electrons right on the central element. Okay? Uh, let me think of it. Well, let's see. Um, okay. So for something like this, um, Br seven I two I mean B minus. Okay, now when you are bonded to two things, how many electrons in your structure will you start out with? 20. How many do I have here? 22. So that should be a clue to me. Wait a second. That's an overabundance of electrons, right? So that situation cannot have it happen unless you have expanded your octet. Okay? So what do I do with those extra electrons? So let me start my structure out like this. Br bonded to I, whoops, that's an H. I, I, okay. I should have do this. Put these, okay. So I can start it out. Something like this, everything's following the rule of eight. I have 20 electrons. Where do those extra electrons go? They go on the central element. That's where they'll always go because that's the thing that's expanding its octet. The eyes are not, they're periphery, so they don't expand their octet, they're just on the outside. They're only making a single bond like they should, okay? What I'm expanding the octet of is the bromine. So I'm gonna put those extra electrons right there. So if I, should have 20, but I have 22, those extra electrons will go right on the central element. That's where they'll always go, okay? If it's an expanded octet. <clears throat> so with that considered, let's consider something else. Look at this one, SO3, okay? Hurt my leg last week and sit down for a second. Okay, so for SO3, um, 
we have each of those sulfur and oxygen each have six so six times four what is that I'm sorry 24 okay 24 electrons okay so we're gonna draw this we know it's gonna have a double bond and it's following the rule of eight, right? Okay, how many electrons are in the other structure I just drew? Twenty-four. So why why would I choose one over the other one? If I was just considering the rule of eight. Does this one, the second one I drew, follow the rule of eight? Look at the sulfur. How many bonds is it making? Six. That's twelve electrons, right? So, which one's correct? The first one is correct if I'm just following the rule of eight. But if I consider expanded octets, how many bonds can sulfur make? It has six valence electrons. It can make six bonds because it expands its octet. So, is that second structure incorrect? No. In fact, we'll learn about this later. But this is probably the more correct structure. And it has to do with something uh, that we haven't considered, which is charges on each of those. Okay? So because right now, if I, if I quickly show you, okay, um, each of these oxygens right now kind of has a negative one charge. This oxygen has a zero charge. Whoops, I haven't drawn it correctly. That one has a zero charge, okay? because it doesn't have abundance of electrons on it. It makes two bonds. Whenever oxygen makes two bonds, it's really happy with that. But here, it's only making a single bond. And so it's got all these other electrons, lone pairs on it that it doesn't really, really want. Okay, And the sulfur in the middle, if I consider that, I only want to make two bonds. I'm making four. So uh, it ends up being um, six, okay, plus two, uh, six. and these are all negative one. Okay, so sulfur is kind of deficient in electrons, whereas the oxygens are abundant in electron. And so I get a plus two charge and a negative one charge on each of the oxygen. That balances out to what? Zero. So this has an overall zero charge on it. But look at this one. Each oxygen is already at a zero charge. And the sulfur is at a zero charge. So which one's happier? Well, this one probably is. Okay, and we're going to look at that later. But some, uh, so, so this could have two structures. Okay, so go ahead and keep working on those. Okay, um, and see if you can come up with maybe even two structures for some of them. Okay.
Okay. <clears throat> um, so, could, could NO2 minus have an expanded octet? Can nitrogen expand its octet? No, it cannot. Okay? Nitrogen is not in the third energy level. It doesn't have a D. Nitrogen cannot expand its octet. So I know that everything in this is going to follow the rule of eight. I can only have one single structure here that follows the rule of eight. Uh, and so when I draw that structure for NO2 minus, uh, what is it? So nitrogen, O2. <coughs> Okay. That's going to be my structure. I know it. Okay. It has a negative one charge. So that's my um, NO2 minus. Can uh, sulfur expand its octet? Yes. So potentially, this one could expand its octet. So I could potentially come up with two structures. Okay? So SO3, 2 minus, sulfur, uh, and O3, that's 6, and 18, that's 24, plus 2, 26 electrons. Okay? So without even drawing it, what's my structure going to look like? Does it have any double bonds? If I'm not considering an expanded octet, no, right? If I don't consider anything with an expanded octet, it doesn't have any uh, double bonds, right? Okay, and that's 26 electrons on, on my structure. Um, now, potentially, I could convert those Okay, so is this a viable structure for sulfur? Can it expand its octet? <clears throat> yes, it can. Okay, so each of these oxygens are at a zero charge. Okay, this sulfur has a negative two on it because of the extra electrons that are on it. Okay, and so this structure would have a two minus charge just like the other one. So here I could potentially have two uh, correct possible structures. Okay. I would prefer both of them. I would want you to show me uh, that there are two possible structures for this. Okay. I would want you to recognize. So, could I have two possible structures for number eleven, potentially? Yes. What about for number twelve? Yes. yes. Okay. And I would want you to show me those structures. So let's look at number 12. Um, PO4, 3 minus. So there's 32 electrons in this, correct? If you add it all together, you get 32 electrons. So if I'm just considering the rule of eight, what's my structure? Are there any bond, double bonds or anything? No. It's going to start out phosphorus, oxygen, 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 oxygen. All single bonds. Okay? <clears throat> and it will have a 3 minus charge because this has a plus 1 on the phosphorus, and we're going to have negative 1s on all these oxygens. So that's a 3 negative overall. Okay? Now, 
Can I draw it in any other way? Okay, so 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 6, uh, I'm sorry, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. Okay, yes. Oh, well, it's not that it can only have five, but I, I, it's because I have three extra electrons, so I can make more than five bonds here. Because this has a three negative charge on it, correct? So, and the phosphorus, in fact, has a negative, you, you'll find out how to do that, but it has a negative one charge on it, which means it has one extra electron on the phosphorus. So it could have, it, because of that extra electron, it can make those, those extra bonds, okay? So this also has a one, two, three minus charge on it, okay? So this is a second potential structure for your four, three minus, okay? Okay, uh, and SO4, same thing, okay? You'll get a, a similar structure as this one for SO4, three minus, all right? So if you can expand your octet, then you should consider whether it potentially could have a second expanded octet structure um, versus just the one that is following the rule of eight. And you said these are only can be done with the third energy level, right? Third, no, anything after anything the second. After the second. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, any of those could expand their octet. Iodine can do it. Uh, often you'll see uh, iodine expanding its octet and bromine. You'll even, because of expanded octet, even though these are inert, sometimes you'll even see a xenon um, that has expanded its octet and it will make some bonds. Okay, uh, so but for the most part, xenon won't react with anything. But it, if it expands its octet and gets its electrons and you know out there in the D, now it has some bonding electrons where before it didn't, and so it can do that, and it it does. Okay, it does do that. Okay. I'm gonna hand this out before I forget to do it. This is the, the homework assignment. And there's stuff on here uh, you're not gonna know how to do yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? But by the end of chapter eight, we're not gonna chapter eight, we're not gonna spend a lot of time with. There's a bunch of stuff in chapter eight that we're not even gonna cover. Okay. Um, but there's basically one or two concepts in there that we're gonna cover that will help you to be able to do this homework. Okay. Uh, mainly hybridization, dipole, okay, and formal charges. satisfied with its uh, structure as it is, okay? Okay, NF3, nope. 
So that's kind of what you're looking for. So like number seven, SH2, could, could sulfur expand its octet? Is it going to? No, it's only bonded to two hydrogens. It's not going to, right? It's just going to have one single structure there, following the rule of eight. Okay? Um, same thing with pH three. Phosphorus could expand its octet, but it only has three hydrogens. It doesn't need to. Okay? I think you'll find it's very satisfied with bonding to just those three hydrogens. All right, and it's done. Okay? Um, and a lot of these other ones, I, I think we've already kind of even looked at. So like SO3, um, PO3. Okay, so those ones potentially could expand their octet and have other uh, expand octet structures. Okay, so the idea behind this is you guys are going to work these out uh, as we go through these, these chapters. And then I'm going to choose uh, like three or four of them for the, the test. Okay? But you will have already done them, you'll just have to redo it. So that means you're going to have to study them and remember how to do them so when you get to the test, uh, you'll know how to do those, those three or four structures that I've chosen to put on the test. Okay? And so that you can answer all these things. What is the hybridization? What is the molecular shape? What is the overall dipole? Um, what are the formal charges? Okay? So these are things that you're going to be able to answer once we get through Chapter 8. Okay. So right now, what you should be able to do is draw the structures of these. And then, as you have those structures drawn and we're going through different things, you're labeling different stuff on these Okay, as we're learning more and more. So for example, um, right here, understanding Vesper, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Okay, So Vesper, uh, is the shape of the molecule based on the repulsion due to the valence shell electron pairs. So if I have electron pairs on my central element, it's going to change the shape of it. If I remove those electron pairs, it allows the elements to just simply spread themselves out around the central element all to the same degree. Okay. <clears throat> So, for example, here, BEH2, okay, there are no electrons on the central element. BE can only make two bonds, and it does, and it has these two things bonded to it. They are 180 degrees away from each other. That's as far as they can get away from each other in all directions, and they will. They'll just spread themselves out as far as they can away from everybody, okay? And that's 180 degrees. So we end up with a linear molecule. So if something has no lone pairs on the central element and it's bonded to two things, it will be linear. From the ones we drew just earlier, just now, do any of those match this definition? Carbon dioxide. Look at CO2. Does it have any? electrons on the central element. Is it bonded to two things? Yes. So what's the shape of it? Linear. Carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. Okay? It is linear. Okay. So here's BF3. It has, makes three bonds. No lone pairs because it can't have any lone pairs. It can only make three bonds and it's done. It only has three electrons. So it makes these three bonds. It's bonded to these three fluorines. Okay? And look, they spread themselves out 120 degrees away from each other. They're 120 degrees away from each other as far as they can. That's as far as they can get away from each other. And what happens is as they do that, it creates this flat triangle, okay? So it's a planar, flat planar molecule. And we would say, because it has three things bonded to it, we'd say it's trigonal. This is a trigonal planar flat molecule. Trigonal planar.
Are there any of the structures you drew from the earlier compounds that match this description? trigonal planar molecule because it has no lone pairs on the central element and it makes three bonds. Those three oxygens are separating themselves as far apart as they can from one another. Okay? Okay, so here's methane. It makes four bonds. It's one central element. There are no lone pairs on the central element. If that's the situation, then we say it's tetrahedral. This is a tetrahedral molecule. Okay, so tetrahedral, let me write that word down. No lone pairs, four bonds, tetrahedral. Was there anything on that sheet earlier, or the, on the structures we drew earlier, that would be tetrahedral? Okay, this one. Anything else? There you go. SO4 two minus, PO4 three minus. Those would have tetrahedral geometries. Good. Okay, now, what happens though if I have a lone pair? That's what happens if I have no lone pairs for two, three, or four things. I am linear, trigonal planar, or tetrahedral. But what if I have make three bonds and I have a lone pair on the central element? Now what happens? Well, that lone pair pushes those other things. They are flat, that flat triangle. But when I put that lone pair on, it pushes those other things down. And I get this configuration. These come down because this is taking up room. That lone pair. See, it pushes all these down. And I get what's called a trigonal pyramidal shape. Trigonal pyramidal. So the molecular geometry here is trigonal because there's three things. And it's pyramidal because the lone pair pushes it down and makes this pyramid shape out of it. Okay? It forces it into that kind of tetrahedral pyramid shape. Um, and we get trigonal pyramidal. Okay, let's look at water. Water also forms this tetrahedral shape, okay? Because it has two lone pairs um, and two hydrogens, so that's four things surrounding the central element, okay? But those two those two hydrogens. So think about it. If I was carbon dioxide, I'm straight out, right? But if I put lone pairs on the central element, it pushes those hydrogens down. So water causes its two things to get pushed down, and it takes on what we call a bit. It's bent, okay? So it has a bent shape. So if I have more than, sorry, if I have two things bonded to my central element and I have lone pairs on the central element, they will bend those hydrogens down and I will end up having a bent electron configuration. Just like I see here, this is a bent shape. So, two things, no lone pairs, linear, two, I should say two bonds, two bonds, lone pair on the central element, bent, two bonds, two lone pairs on the central element, 
bent. It doesn't matter how many lone pairs are on the central element, it will be bent if there are some. Okay? Three bonds, trigonal, no lone pairs, trigonal planar. Three bonds, trigonal, lone pairs, trigonal pyramidal. Okay? The lone pairs cause it to go into a pyramidal structure. Okay, um, so basic procedure to, to determine the shapes, write the Lewis structures, count the number of bonds, um, and ha whether it has electrons on the central element. Okay, if there are no lone pairs, linear, trigonal planar, or tetrahedral. Okay, if it does have uh, lone pairs, then that's going to cause that to change into bent, trigonal planar, or, uh, or trigonal planar, I should say. Okay, that's fine. Okay, determine the geometry of the following compounds. Let's just, uh, let's just do it like this. Um, let's do it next time, because we're out of time, okay. <laughs>